Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Monday Q&A with Felicia Menta and Dr. Deborah Dupree. Thank you for being here. And as a welcome to you all, we're discussing some hot topics today and uh, things keep changing. Felicia and I were just talking about how even over the weekend, you know, and updating our research and checking out new developments and it's an ongoing story. I think many of you may have heard me say in the past in my I hate to say this, over 30 years of doing this kind of work, there have been more changes in the last couple of years than we've seen throughout the entirety since the ADA was passed in 1990. And so with that, again, welcome, Felicia. Oh, thank you, Deborah. It's a pleasure to be here. Very good. Very good. Well, we've got a lot on our plate today, and I just want to uh, acknowledge for everybody, uh, this is recorded. And so within a few days, we'll have a email sent out with the recording link. And I've got a couple of resources I'm going to share on my end. And usually Felicia's got some links that she'll share as well. And so uh, with that, you know, uh, just like summer, the temperature is rising. And, you know, we've got COVID surges again, masks revisited, and just simply the toll of ongoing stress. So Felicia, I wanted to turn that to you first, because you know, you you know, well, we've talked already about how all the school districts are a little bit different. So what's some of the latest and greatest breaking news? So I, I was telling Deborah, I, I, as I was, we were tell, talking about it, I did some research before the weekend, but then there was some new numbers that came out over the weekend. So I had to update my research that I did. But basically just as a COVID-19 update of what's happening, we talked about it in our board meeting a little bit. Since the beginning of the pandemic and since March 2020 to now until the end of May, which is when we run the numbers, we had four, over 47,000, wait, that's not right. I'm sorry. I ran the numbers for just January through May since the surge, since we returned. Oh, okay. So January to May of 2022, we had 233,447 entries into the Athens positive COVID-19 portal. We have not had very many workers' compensation claims filed out of the total workers' comp. I think we've had 27 workers' compensation COVID claims filed since March of 2020 to date. Interestingly enough, I would say it's about half and half. We're running about, after investigation, about half the claims are ending up being accepted as being work-related to exposure with a coworker and a, or a student. And about half of the claims are determined to be due to a family relationship or a party or something that was attended off-site. And I do have to say that in the investigation, most of the injured employees or the employees with COVID are being pretty honest about Mm -hmm. answering questions about where they've been the 14 days before their symptoms started. So we have been able to get the information that we need for the most part pretty quickly. Great. I took a look at the San Diego County does a very nice update. And I looked at it last week, but I just, they put out two days ago, uh, new data through June 18 during the previous three months. So the recent COVID-19 cases, it's 822,808. That's the most recent data in 90 days. The new cases by the day are 1,629. And those are obviously county numbers, right? Positive PCR tests. And then the rolling seven-day average for positive tests is running about 33.5% per 100,000 people tested, which is about a third. About a third of the people that are tested are positive Mm -hmm. and about two-thirds are negative. That's about how it's running. I did take a look at the vaccination. And it looks mm-hmm. like as of the day this the county ran this numbers, at least one dose of vaccine, the percentage of San Diegans age five or over is 94.6%. Now that's just one dose. And then San Diegans age 12 or over that have are fully vaccinated and received a booster is 57.3%. Obviously, that percentage goes way down when you just look at 5 to 11 and 11 to 18, right? It's really low. Like 5 to 11 was 5% and 12 to 19 is 10%. You know, so the population is lower when you get there of fully Mm -hmm. vaccinated and boosted. It's pretty small. And obviously, for the little guys, we know why, because that relatively new and there's a lot of more hesitancy in the Mm -hmm. younger ages uh, from what they're seeing. So that's kind of, and anecdotally, what we have been seeing from a claims perspective on the workers' comp side, because we see all the 
COVID-19 going into the portal, we had a huge surge in January. And Mm -hmm. then we came and then, and then we came, we've slowly been coming back down in February. We still had a lot of positive in March, a lot of positive, and we got a little better in April. I do have to say, we're seeing a little rise again, (laughs) ever Mm -hmm. since spring break. And since people have been traveling and came back to school, anecdotally, we've been seeing an increase in cases, not Mm -hmm. anything like January, nothing like the Omicron surge that we saw. Mm -hmm. But we have been watching really closely what's happening, because we do see a little uptick. You know, that's, um, and thank you for those great stats. And so I wanted to go back just a second. I wanted to make sure I heard the number right. How many workers comp um, claims have actually been out of COVID? 27 total claims since the very beginning of COVID were filed as workers' comp claims. Okay. There have been, just in the last five months, there have been 233,000 447 claims reported by our member districts into the Athens portal. Those are employees, not students that have Mm -hmm. tested, that have reported testing positive. Mm -hmm. They only Mm -hmm. report the ones that the employees report. That's not everyone, right? That's the Mm -hmm. ones you know about. Okay. Well, you know, I I think overall, then I guess I'm surprised that only 27 are actually workers comp related, which I think is pretty remarkable given that. Well, and only out of the 27 were filed, I think 13 were denied and 14 were accepted. So yeah, you're right, though, the number is really small of claims that after investigation have been accepted. So what it tells me is that a lot of employees that test positive, they either don't believe they got it at work, or their symptoms are relatively mild, and they don't feel it rises, and also because of the COVID pay. That's also Mm. helping a lot. They're getting paid for their quarantine time. If that wasn't happening, we would have a lot more claims, believe me. Well, something else that that tells me, and and tell me if you think this is accurate, is that if, you know, given the, you know, the high number of cases reported, but the relatively low number of workers' comp work related claims that that would suggest that people have really been doing a pretty darn good job at the workplace in terms of their mask wearing, the sanitization, all of those kinds of things seem like they really have been working. That's what I think, and that's what Lost Control thinks that our member districts have been doing an awesome job trying to keep their staff and their students safe, and it has not been easy, right? No, right. Easy job. Very, very fantastic. Kudos to all of you, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 absolutely. And it's interesting then because it does raise the question about those who are resistant to being to being vaccinated or those who are resistant to wearing masks, given the change in mandates, you know, at the state level or CDC or, or CDPH. And so I know that that is something that's come up quite a bit in some of the COVID related IPMs that I've been doing. And so, you know, it's just interesting. It's interesting. Well, and the weekly testing still in play. Mm -hmm. You know, the only way, the only exception I know to that is if you, if you do get COVID, if you get COVID, then you go out of weekly rotation because you're going to test positive for a while Mm -hmm. and then you come back in, but your, our employees that aren't vaccinated are still being tested weekly. Mm -hmm. You can, you can work for us being unvaccinated, but you're still in the weekly testing, meaning that has not been, I get a lot of questions from districts, like, has that been, has that been discontinued or has, Mm -hmm. has that stopped? And, and that is still in place. Okay. Yep. I'm curious, again, from a a district perspective, I mean, I am aware of, you know, a couple of districts that I work with, not all of of whom are in the JPA, but, you know, are are requiring that all employees be vaccinated Mm -hmm. in order to continue working. And what one particular one I know has done is that, you know, taking it through a series of steps that, you know, requiring vaccination for all new employees, and then for all existing employees, if they choose not to be vaccinated, they're given another six months of temporary accommodation, uh, but must continue wearing the mask and being weekly tested. But that's the one I'm thinking about will expire 
as of the end of December 2022. And we'll see where things are going in terms of COVID at that point. But right now, you know, the, the district policy is to require vaccination of all employees after and, 2023. LA Unified certainly took that position early mm-hmm. on that that's what their board decided is they were going to go a little further than Governor Newsom's mm-hmm. um, rule. And they mandate vaccination or you're right, you have to request a religious exemption or an IPM to discuss if you need a medical accommodation, but they had to, you know, that they had to terminate and have lots and lots of IPMs over that particular issue because that was something that they required. Right. All right. I, I would like to just note for everybody, too, that, you know, because a lot of the questions we've, we've received in those COVID IPMs where people are requesting a religious accommodation or underlying medical condition, but a lot of the, I guess, concern was sort of twofold, is that how can a district impose greater requirements than what the federal or state guidelines are, are, are all about? So that's one primary one. And so I'll, I'll address that here in a moment. The other key question tend, tends to be about, well, why do I have to keep wearing a mask? Because we know that you know, vaccinated people can get COVID too. And so I'll, I'll take both of those on right now. It's always important to know that the federal level is sort of sets the bar, so to speak. But that doesn't mean that state can't you know impose greater guidelines, restrictions, however you want to call it. And they do so on a variety of levels, not just when it comes to medical conditions. There are all kinds of laws like California has that go far beyond what anybody else has done. And that's why states vary so much on, on certain levels. And with that, then, you know, so this, the federal, you can't go less than the federal level but you can go higher. And that's true within California too. And it, it can be employer or, in, or industry specific, depending upon the circumstances in your organization. And so, you know, there are some organizations where there may be a greater risk given the nature of their work, like healthcare, for example, you know, mm-hmm. or like in the school districts working with children and so forth. So it's always really important to, to know that, you know, depending upon what level you are, you can have greater restrictions, but you can't have less restrictions than the state level. And so that's that's, people don't understand that, you know, say, well, why do, you, why do we have to go further than what the governor's recommended or what CDC or CDPH have, have recommended? So, and again, depending upon where you are, your district may compel uh, certain guidelines, uh, whereas others, even within, within San Diego County, you know, so that's, that's the other thing. The other thing that I've, I've tried to address in the IPMs with COVID related is that, yes, we, we now know. It was surprising, you know, when we realized people who had were vaccinated were still getting sick. I'm one of them, you know, and I was so careful for so long and I still got sick because of some exposure um, during travel. And not just, I, not me, but my daughter's actually been sick three times since the first of the year and fully vaccinated, all that kind of stuff. The thing is, though, is that stress that, you know, the, your employer is obligated to take action to, to protect the greater masses. Mm-hmm. And so uh, what we do know is that even if you've been vaccinated and you get COVID, you're not likely to be as sick. You know, so we know now that the you know, symptoms are, are not as severe like they were in the early days of COVID where it was a life and death matter. And so and so particularly for those who are who choose not to, for whatever the reason, become vaccinated, again, it's for their protection, the greater good, the greater safety right. of the masses. And that is why <clears throat> even though the masks were lifted in California, mm-hmm. uh, masks are coming back for some students and staff at some of our at some of the school districts due to the rising cases that I talked about in the beginning. And that's a brand new that's happening like now, right now. Yeah. I know, you know, things have changed even over the weekend, but do you have any predilection for, you know, as school starts up here pretty soon again? Yeah, well, so we can see what's happening. So San Diego Unified, which is second largest school district in California and the largest in San Diego County, and we kind of watch them to see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They have had an increase in COVID-19 cases since spring break. So they sent a letter out last week, just last week, May 24th, they sent a letter out that masks may be coming back for students and staff at San Diego Unified. And on Monday, the letter they sent to staff and students basically said masks could return for certain schools if risk levels are met. And so then I took a look at the risk levels because this is just happening like this week. If 10% or more of the student population is absent for three consecutive days due to illness, that's one trigger, 
The second trigger is if when the past 14 days, at least three outbreaks have occurred on campus. Remember, outbreak is California outbreak, three or more, not California work comp outbreak, which is four or more. That's mm-hmm. confusing, but I know. Three outbreaks have occurred on campus and more than 5% of the school population is affected. What they have determined is that it's going to be on a school by school basis. They're not okay. going to do an entire school district wide mm-hmm. masks are, you know, need to be worn again. It's based on these triggers and then school by school masks need to be worn. But they sent a letter out to everybody and that this might happen as soon as like this Wednesday. So this is like right now. And then since spring break, I took a look at Sweetwater's policy because they have had more recent cases reported. And so Sweetwater just has up on their new policy commencing June 6, 2022. So this is just happening this month for all summer school, summer programs and extracurricular activities, all students and staff working indoors in the presence of students will be required to wear masks. That's you know, this month. When outside the presence of students, the current protocols are in place. And you know what that is, highly recommended, but not mandatory. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to reassess the COVID data and make a determination about COVID protocols to implement for the start of the school year. And you have to remember Sweetwater's year round, Mm -hmm. they start July 13, 22. So we'll watch that space to see what happens because they're going to start before most of our other member districts and schools start in for fall in August most of them start sometime in August. So we'll have to watch that space. I also looked up today because I've been looking to see what LA Unified did Mm -hmm. because they usually also take the most restrictive position or a more restrictive position. LA Unified had to negotiate, you know, the end of their mask wearing. So they Mm -hmm. lifted it far later than the state. I think it was March 23rd with their United Teachers Union of Los Angeles. So they, I haven't seen any change in their mask wearing policy, but that's what's happening right now. I haven't seen a lot of our other districts start wearing masks again. I haven't seen Mm -hmm. that. But anyway, we'll have to watch this space because things are changing again. Right, right. Which actually feeds into the second part of our our, um, question then too, is the toll of ongoing stress because of the uh, changing, fluctuating circumstances. And so, you know, we've used the term before, it's just a roller coaster, you know, and uh, unfortunately, the roller coaster is still going. And again, maybe not as uh, high and as low as it was back in 2020 and early 2021. However, it's still going. And, And so this is something to, for anybody in HR risk to be really aware of, making sure that early and active referral to employee assistance programs, you know, and don't hesitate to have conversations with people about fears of what's going on and so forth. I, I certainly have seen, and I'm sure you have too, Felicia, is that, you know, the number of of cases that have evolved in the aftermath of COVID. And, you know, it didn't necessarily start, you know, with COVID, but, you know, because of the ongoing stress and uncertainty, you know, I've seen more cases of anxiety. We uh, have rise in stress claims and work yeah. stress claims. They, it's due to other things too, but it has to do with this underlying mm-hmm. fear and anxiety. And then things are happening with supervisors and coworkers and students it's sort of amplifying everything, if that makes sense, Deborah. And as a psychologist, you, you, you know, you can address that better than I. But that's what I see: an increase in a rise in our stress and psych mm-hmm. claims. And then when I look at those claims, yes, they're related to HR and personnel and student activity. But there's also just this low-level rise in fear and anxiety. Yeah, yeah. And on that note, you know, again, I've I've seen a few cases where, you know, people have been out for of work pretty much throughout the whole COVID time, and not necessarily related to COVID, but because of the nature of their medical condition, the delays in medical treatment, then therefore the delays in recovery. And so coming back to work has been highly stressful, because in so many ways, you know, work practices have changed, automation, new technology has changed. And so we're we're seeing, you know, where some people are not adjusting well, uh, in spite of the accommodations we've attempted, and um, it's not working. And so that's one thing to, uh, I'm going to jump a little bit to best practices on, um, which was our topic number four, but since we're talking about it, it seems to make sense. 
you know, keep in mind, you know, we talk about readily achievable, effective accommodations to facilitate someone's ability to, to perform all the essential functions of their assigned job to the level of performance required to deliver on the uh, intended objectives of their assigned duties. And so I've added that last piece, you know, to, you know, to the level of performance required, as I've had a couple of cases recently where in spite of the accommodations, in spite of, you know, transition time and supportive help, they are still falling far short of expected performance levels. And so what that says then is that the accommodations are not effective. They're not being able to perform all the essential functions to the level expected. Therefore, the accommodations are not, are not working. And so it's now taking it to another direction. And so it's important that we always evaluate these kinds of things, you know, in light of that. One of the, I've got a couple of links I'm going to share in terms of, you know, best practices um, when we set out the the video. It's almost too much to go into here, but just a a couple of key things are that it's, it's always better to start early then wait too long because the longer someone's able to persist in either a modified job or not have their whole uh, illness or injury addressed, the harder it is to, to be successful and to get that person back to work. And so I always encourage people that if someone's been off of work for 90 days, that's actually a great time to, to initiate the, the, the communication about the interactive process. And again, you know, how can I help you? That's, that's the, the big phrase is that it seems that there's been an increased absenteeism you know, you've been off of work for a while. So you know, help us understand what's going on for you so that we can see about uh, implementing effective accommodations. And that's where, again, it's in, from a helping mindset that we want to approach this. A lot of people sometimes respond that, well, you're prying into my life. Well, no, as your employer, we have an obligation to. If you're not at work, and that's why I say be at work, stay at work and perform the work. If you're not, if you're not doing any one of those three, then there's something going on. And if it's a medical condition, then we have an obligation to engage you in the interactive process to see how we can help you, how we can accommodate you. And so coming from a place of compassion becomes really important. When, and so when you have that early response pattern, and again, from a helping capacity, it's much easier to turn things around before it becomes really problematic. And again, educate empl- employees about the interactive process, as I am oftentimes say in the IPMs, unless you develop a medical condition, or unless you're, as an employee, you're, this is the first employee you've had with a medical condition, Tradition. Most people don't know anything about this entire process, even though it's been around more than 30 years. So, and I, I think to add to that, I have been invited recently to quite a few very, what I will say, difficult IPMs. And, and you know, sometimes you're there and sometimes I'm there with the district. And two things that I know, sometimes when an employee is represented by an attorney on the work comp claim, sometimes mm-hmm. if they're not, but a lot of times when they're represented, the districts are very reluctant to engage in their regular return to work practices mm-hmm. that they would do with anybody else, which mm-hmm. all of those conversations still take place, whether they have a work comp attorney or not, because all of the return to work and obligations in ADA and FIHA and EEOC, they have nothing to do with the work comp mm-hmm. claim. So yeah, because it's a work comp claim, it's almost incidental to the fact that you still work for us and we still have to have conversations and we mm-hmm. want you We want to welcome you back to work and we want to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And we also want to follow our policy so we don't, the other thing that's such a misstep and, you know, you and I see it quite a bit is districts wanting in with best intentions will leave somebody in a modified duty capacity, not their real job for two to three years, and then try to come back Mm -hmm. and say, sorry, we got the permanent work restrictions. There's no way we can accommodate these. And that is just spark start flying. Mm -hmm. And then we have, you know, three or four union reps at a meeting. You and I, I have been to at least three or four meetings where there have been more than three union reps there. And that always tells me trouble with a big capital T, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't communicate well all along this way. Way, so that this was a shock when we got here should never be a shock when we're, you know, and, and you know, what happens is a lot of times the conclusion that the union might draw, well, you've been able to accommodate all this time. Mm-hmm. Why can't you do it forever? Why are you saying now that you can't? So it's really, you have to be really careful as you're proceeding and it's better to meet and talk too much rather than not enough to your point. Yeah, actually, and I don't remember the year, but the EEOC actually had a ruling on this many years ago, as far as if you go beyond the standard, and at the federal level, it's recommended to be 180 days is the maximum temporary accommodation. And that goes for being absent from the workplace, too. 
and that's why right. yeah yeah keep in mind school districts you know you know what your what your policy is because these are bargained agreements too you know 60 plus 60 or 90 plus 90 or however you break it down but again that applies to people being off of work as well as you know being in modified duty again you want to evaluate that early on and on that note if somebody is doing modified duty for 60 days, but their condition is not changing. It's not getting better. The limitations are still the same. Stop. <laughs> Stop mm-hmm. right there. You know, because it's again, the accommodations are not working. They're not improving. And that's where a conversation is important then is that, you know, what's the likelihood that they are going to be able to recover well enough to perform all the essential functions with or without accommodations? Or if their their condition is you know, I've been in cases recently where there have been no change for months and months and months, even when they were released to maximum medical improvement, the limitations had not changed at all. And sometimes even when the person wasn't working. And so what makes you think that they're going to be able to do the job uh, when they do come back and, the, and they have already been so limited? And what I see, you know, just because I've been doing this for 40 years, right, since I started when I was two, um, <laughs> the, the what I see a lot is if the work restrictions don't change, mm-hmm. you can anticipate, certainly if they don't change, you know how Sweetwater and Grossmont have bargained a longer period of time. So they do mm-hmm. 90 plus 90, more than right. most of the district, to 180. That 180 backs up to that EEOC ruling that you said. Okay. Six months and you have to go home if you are not permanent stationary and not back to work. And But it's interesting because one of the things that they really do is if it's if they haven't changed in all that time, they mm-hmm. probably are going to be permanent. This is what I see from the doctors. Mm-hmm. They're not changing, not changing, not changing. Because what happens, I notice when we start meeting with them, when the district mm-hmm. starts meeting with them, they'll go to the doctor and they'll have their notes start changing. Yep. Things do start changing because mm-hmm. they start having conversations and it's more dynamic, right? Right. Yeah, that is so true. I worked with a, a major power and water utility for quite a few years, and they got sued early on after the ADA uh, and FIHA were, were passed and failure to accommodate. And so out of that, we're, we, you know, they asked me to design their program. And it was amazing how fast people started coming back to work after lengthy absences and again, unchanging positions when you open that dialogue and you educate them and you set clear expectations. And that's really what the interactive process designed to do is engage the employee, inform them of the process, inform them of your policies and set clear uh, expectations for timelines. And without doing that, Right. Also, so they're not shocked about financial pitfalls. You're running mm-hmm. out of leave. You're running out of pay. Mm-hmm. You're right. running out of sick leave. You're going to go on half pay. A lot of times when I'll talk to employees and they have no idea what's going on mm-hmm. with their situation, at, whereas it's the first question I ask them, how much sick leave do you have left? When are you going into half pay? Where are you at with your leave practices? And they're thinking, what? I don't know. But you're right. This is something we need to be communicated. This also changes notes and changes Steps, yeah. right? Letting them know that things are running out. So I'm not sure if that's a payroll risk management disconnect with employees, because it isn't like you have a little clock on your paycheck that tells you, you know, how much leave you're running down until you're running out of leave yeah. on 39 months. But I almost wish it was. I almost mm-hmm. wish there was on your paycheck. Like, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. Because a lot of times we get to bad places and they have no idea yeah. that they're almost out of everything. Yeah. Well, and with that too, that that again, coming from a place of compassion, because imagine, you know, you're not only dealing with the medical condition, which is stressful, you know, unexpected, long-term, whatever, but now you're faced with potentially losing your job, you know? And so that really sends people into a whole mindset as well. And again, EAP is really critically important to support people through that. But again, coming from a place of compassion, because I mean, you and I both seen too often, you know, where, you know, there's like 20 days left of the 100 days of half lead, and now they're ready to go into the 39 months and lose your insurance. And to realistically squash, particularly if retirement is a possibility, I know people who want to try to stay working for a couple more years, but it may not be realistic on the job front. And so it's just really things take your idea. I really love your idea. Since Ease MHN is covered and it's free for everyone, anybody mm-hmm. that's doing an IPM, non-industrial or industrial, a referral information to ease MHN should probably be happening right up front because IPMs can be stressful. 
Yes, very stressful. And the other thing too is for employers to keep in mind, referring them to the job accommodation network, because uh, I just dealt with a person who hadn't really done the proper documentation for a service dog. And there was a lot of confusion about what kind of dog is this? Because, you know, service dog versus a support animal, there are different rules that apply about what goes on and what's required and and so forth. And so is the dog trained or not? Because, you know, they're saying it was a service dog. But so anyway, she was not happy with the IPM for sure. But it's like, you know, contact the job accommodation network. I said, yeah, I've read the guidance. So, you know, here's what it is. And it's not that it's not that your employer is going to deny you having a support animal there, but you have to meet the district's um, compliance requirements for documentation. That's all we're trying to get, you know, to, to clarify what's the purpose. And it wasn't just one dog. She had two dogs. Uh, one was officially trained as, as a service dog to be part of the program, but the other one was for her, her needs. And so there was, a, a, again, a lot of confusion, a lack of clarity. And I had to, you know, revisit all the guidelines too. It's, 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 it can be confusing. And so working with the medical provider, we just got the information in just shortly before we got on the call. So yeah, yeah. The other thing I wanted to just address on that note too, is that important to have balance at the table. You know, if you've got four people from the district side and the employee, that could feel a little overwhelming. And while my role is supposed to be neutral and impartial, you know, um, because I, and I, people will talk to me first and say, well, well, yeah, they're paying me. That's typically how this process works is the employer pays for this service. I'd be happy to send the invoice to you if you want to pay for it. <laughs> say, oh, no, no, no. Say, well, you know, my job is to be neutral here and uh, to inform on both sides what needs to happen and things like that. And so be clear about how many people, and, and you know, it's like to have three union reps as well. And so suddenly we get a very crowded room, mm-hmm. and which is why I appreciate being able to do the IPMs on an ongoing basis with Zoom now, because it doesn't feel quite so crowded, but uh, and certainly less risky than uh, being in a room. Yeah, so be, be mindful of who's there. And, and I always try to explain the roles of the people involved as well. And again, making sure that employees, I freely share my video site mm-hmm. where people can get sent and to share that with people so they can get acquainted with the process. I also have the tip online, you know, that gives it a little instruction to people on how to connect with Zoom, but then also the structure of the meeting. Share those with your employees so that they are informed because anytime you walk into something new, it's fearful. It's frightening. Well, and I also think there should be more upfront work done. If you're going to bring an advisory council, I think the employee should be advised that you're going to do that. I don't mm-hmm. think that should be strong on them because that way, if they want to bring an attorney, they can, right? Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. just fair play. Yeah. And I think that if you're going to have four people from the district, you might want to tell the district there's, you know, or the employee, there's going to be a lot of people in here. You might want to bring a family member or a union. And really, mm-hmm. I think that should be a regular process because yeah. you kind of need support in these meetings. There's there's a lot of, I only get invited by districts to come to meetings where I think the employee isn't going to be able to be accommodated. So that's mm-hmm. very sad. And usually there's crying or it's not, doesn't go well. And yeah. Usually when I get invited to come, things are really complicated. And there's, you're right, a lot of people there and there's unhappiness. But what always, always surprises me is if an employee is there alone, and the district's got four people, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it just doesn't, the look is not good, right? It doesn't yeah. look like they've got enough support in the room. So what right. are you right. that? Yeah. And again, to just, you know, remind people too, that this is, uh, you know, people are, their lives have been altered because of a medical condition, maybe temporary, maybe long-term, but then too, is that, you know, their, their ability to work is impacted in some form or fashion. And particularly if their condition is severe enough, then we're talking about job loss as well. And so again, those are all fearful factors and making sure we have get people proper support is, is critical. And that's why, you know, I mean, sure, I'd like everybody to use my services, but that's where I can help by by using me to be that intermediary, then it helps preserve the employer-employee relationship too. It doesn't look make HR look like the bad guy or being the heavy. And uh, let me do that. <laughs> so, right. Well, yeah. we mediate a lot in workers' comp. We use mediators to help us. If we don't want to go to trial, we I've been on several mediations recently mm-hmm. with employees and their attorneys to try to resolve things. And you're right, we pay a mediator mm-hmm. to help us kind of navigate. And that person we're, is impartial. Yes, we pay for the mediator. Of course mm-hmm. we do. But their job is to work for all parties. And right. 
and be represent all parties. That's their ethical obligation. And we find it very helpful. So that's obviously why the JPA contracts with you. So mm-hmm. that if the district feels like they're not sophisticated enough and they don't have a lot of experience with this, that they might want to use a professional medium. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, and I'll just uh, add add to that note, since you you ethically, there is a code of ethics that mediators follow. So there are standards that that we must abide by. And I myself am part of the American Bar Association, a dispute resolution section, as well as the American Arbitration Association. And I'm an employment mediator there. And so both organizations and, uh, you know, have their code of ethics and standards of practice. But actually, when was it about 20 years ago? In the late 1990s, actually, three major organizations came together to jointly work out a code of ethics and standards of practice and that we still abide by. And so professionally trained, yeah. I wanted to add real quick, I know we're, our time is running short. We had a little example at one of our, an issue with OSHA, with one of our smaller districts. Mm-hmm. And if it's all right, thought I'd bring it up. We had one of our smaller districts that had an incident involving a special ed student where it was an employee and some other employees, there were some mm-hmm. injuries. As a result, this is a large special ed student and there was more comp injuries. So what happened was it the person did get care, but it wasn't, didn't rise to the level of a serious illness that where they were hospitalized overnight and we needed to call OSHA. One of the Mm -hmm. employees complained to OSHA after the event and that triggered uh, an audit. And so then OSHA called the principal and just showed up on the site without advising, like the district office didn't know what was going on. And then OSHA just walked the site. And then they got a letter from OSHA about all the things that they needed, that they needed their IIPP, and they needed all of the safety procedures and all the rules about emergency situations. And this was kind of around the time of the Uvalde shooting. Mm -hmm. And so they really wanted to revisit their emergency procedures, their safety protocols. They literally asked for a 20 page, 20 20 listing itemization of what they needed. And we haven't even seen what fines they found yet. So when you, if you have a complaint or a call, your principals, your sites from OSHA, they must call you right away because we want loss control really to come and walk the site with OSHA. They can look at anything that they can see in their line of sight. This was not about just the special ed department and what Mm -hmm. happened with this particular student and these employees. They kind of went any, they can go anywhere on the property once they're there. So that's why we want to make sure. And then you know what happened after this? Mm -hmm. They were like, they had had a turnover in HR and risk management. So they didn't even know where the IIPP was. They couldn't even find it in the beginning. And so we scrambled really quickly. Loss control was wonderful about helping them, you know, get their IIP updated and getting their safety procedures and memos written and finding things. So you want to make sure Mm -hmm. before something like this happens, a serious injury that OSHA is going to visit or an employee calls and complains, which triggers the visit that you, that risk and HR, you know where the IIPP is. You Mm -hmm. dust it off at least once a year, a minimum once a year, and go over it with loss control. Make sure it's still updated for COVID, that it's got response to injuries for school violence, revisiting your emergency response and your safety protocols. And it's no cost, you know, meeting with your loss control team and having them come out and help you because you don't want to be in this situation like this little small district where they were under the gun. I think they gave them three days to provide Mm -hmm. all of this information. We all had to stop what we were doing and literally stop and help them walk through to get ready for these responses. So that was just my cautionary tale that whoever is responsible for these, and it kind of falls through the cracks too, whether it's facilities or HR or uh, site principal, I really think it's a district office thing and everybody in risk and HR and safety should know where that IIPP is and that it's current, (laughs) that it's been looked at. And because this one was super old, right? So they had to look at it and then it had to be rewritten. It didn't have COVID protocol. It didn't have all of the most current safety. And because of the Uvalde shooting, we know that OSHA is you know, on the watch mm-hmm. and they're going out and looking. So you just want to make sure, just a reminder that to your staff that are in charge of this, that you're kind of keeping this summer's a good time to revisit policies and procedures, right? When we don't have as many students on campus. 
Well, thanks for bringing that up because, yeah, it is really important that uh, on any of your practices that we revisit how, how are they working and what needs to be updated, what new rulings are out there, because that will be exactly the kind of thing that can you know get you caught off guard and face potential fines on a number of levels. Yeah, yeah. So, Felicia, as we begin to wrap up here, lessons learned. What would you say are maybe the top two two or three takeaways from, from what we've been going through? I guess when we're looking at disabilities, I just don't make, even though I'm over the workers' comp, I don't make this big distinction between industrial and non-industrial mm-hmm. when we're talking about return to work. I really think it applies to all of our disabled or employees with a disability. I just don't limit it to workers' comp, but a lot mm-hmm. of the districts do. They only do their return to work policy for work comp, not for the other. And I've had a lot of questions about fit for duty for Mm -hmm. disabilities because a lot of the doctors that we know that we work with, some of them do fit for duty. So a lot of people reach out. Fit for duties are completely separate from workers' comp. They don't go in the work comp file. The work comp examiner has nothing to do with them. You have to talk to me about those. And they they shouldn't even know about that doing one. And if they live in the non-industrial world, then obviously all those conditions are HIPAA protected and you have to walk carefully when you're doing fit for duty. You have to be more careful what you're doing. That's why we use certain people that really understand the rules with regards to those because of the, there's medical confidentiality in workers. But it's not like HIPAA, right? Yeah. HIPAA is a whole different issue. Yeah. And one thing I, I would also suggest on, on that note about fitness for duty is that I would really encourage employers to hold an IPM first before just launching into a, a fitness for duty. Because again, from an accommodation standpoint, it's it's got its place. And again, you want to be able to explain to the employee what's going on and how this works together. And what I've oftentimes found is that when we do do um, an IPM before we go for fitness for duty, that you know, there's two things. Is that one, the IPM can be used to gather the necessary information you need for the fitness for duty. What are the concerns here? What parts of the job are, are we um, are we questioning? And then two is that we sometimes find that we don't really need a fitness for duty. We're actually able to figure out some form of accommodation without doing that. And sometimes the employee is able to get the clarifying medical information from their own doctor when appropriate. But I certainly have seen many cases too where the, the medical providers just go, what? <laughs> we don't know how to evaluate for this. And, and so that's very important that people understand too that you know the whole area of occupational medicine is where doctors know how to evaluate abilities against job functions and things like that. It's much like a physical coming to, you know, getting hired for the job. And so, you know, again, think ahead, plan ahead. And again, this is your employee. Treat them with care and concern. Well, very good. So any anything else, Felicia? No, I think uh, we covered a lot. Yeah. <laughs> covered a it, may lot not have been, it may not have been as sequential as what the, the email said, but uh, we did cover all the topics. Okay. And I just want a reminder to everybody, we will be dark in July, taking the month off so everyone can get their summer vacations in. We'll be resuming um, the third week in August. And so watch your emails and, and things like that. And we had a little bit of a blimp today because we didn't get the, uh, my team didn't get the notice out last week the way it should have been. So we'll try to remedy that for August. So with that, uh, thank you everyone for attending. Again, we will be sending out an email with the recording link and a couple of those resources. I happen to also put them into the um, chat box if you open them up. With that, you know, I want to wish you well uh, for the summer months. And I just realized I forgot to do one more link. So I'm going to put my website where the uh, video and overview is uh, that you can share with people. So everyone have a great summer. Enjoy. We got a heat wave coming. The temperature's (laughs) rising. Yes. Have a wonderful summer, everybody. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.